We're ready to stand, all right. Yeah, there he is. There's Hammond right there. Thank you. Got some very special items here that we can take care of. Show them and share them with you in a little bit. This is my daughter, Emery. She might want to hang out out here. You want to go sit down? Henry seven, Bowen's twelve. He just barely turned twelve. I have uh, six children, uh, three boys, three girls. Wow. My oldest is fifteen. My youngest is three years old. And uh, when I was first taken, and my son was almost one, and uh, I spent the last two years in federal detention centers, prison, some of the worst circumstances. Jeez. Um, and, uh, and then I was able to, after a long battle, through two federal trials, I was able to go home to my family on my uh, son's three-year-old birthday. <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of background. So my family uh, are five, five generation ranchers in Southern Nevada. Uh, my great great grandfathers, or great 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 grandfathers, moved into the area in 1877. It's January 7th, 1877, is when they came into the valley. And it was a, it was a, de it's a desert. I mean, it's as desert as you can get. And, um, you know, they, they were sent down there by Brigham Young to go check out the area and try to establish it if they could. And in fact, it wasn't the, they weren't the first to be sent down there. The first group that went down there, they came back after uh, not even a year, and they said that the area was uninhabitable. Uh, and Thank so that you. gives you a little bit of idea where my family went. And there is a lot of beauty down there, but it is also a dry desert. Yep. And they began to establish the uh, fields. They had the level room. They had the water diversion, I mean, much of what has not happened here as well, the water diversion had to put the miles of, above so they could get the flow down to the, the higher fields. Um, and then they also came in that valley with cattle, and they began to graze upon the hills. And what they found up in the mountains, the foothill areas there, they found springs. They're very small springs. And, but, but any little water, any drop of water was just extremely valuable. So they captured those those springs and they began to divert them throughout the desert so that the cattle could, wouldn't have to move so far for, for water. And we're talking about an area where it, it takes about 100 acres to produce enough food for one cow. And so my, my father ranches in an area of about 200 acres. Just and, and and it's still. I remember when I was 15 years old. You know, I always had a dream to be able to, you know, work on the ranch and have that lifestyle. And my, I have several brothers older than me. And my dad said to me when I was about 15, he said, "Son, this ranch is only, you know, produce enough for maybe two families. There's just not enough. Uh, you know, there's not enough." income to be able to produce enough um, profit for, for more than two families. And, and it was his way of trying to tell me, son, you better find another way. <laughs> and, but it wasn't, you know, it was just simply the facts, the reality of things. It's just not an easy it's place right. to produce cattle. But, but yet, it's amazing that my dad was... and other ranchers in that area have been able to Put cattle out on the desert. No, you know, no, no. Uh, it's too close. Develop if you close. want the, the breed to be able to, for them to live out there. They have to have some. Uh, they have to have at least a quarter of uh, Brahma in them. Uh, we always call. It, they have to have to have some ear in them. You know, and um, and that's because the Brahma is the only breed that sweats. And so they otherwise they they, they literally will just die out there. They can't survive. And so, 
that's you know, and my my forefathers came in there and they they I mean they began to carve a living out of that area and it was very difficult. And, and uh, in 1890, they decided well the state of Nevada uh, provided a way for them to register their water rights, uh, to take these waters and file them with the state. And they, the state called them uh, stock watering rights, and they were tied to the grazing rights. And so all the processes, the legal processes took place. They filed with the state. Do you want to, um, today my dad are you keeping that seat right there, the one where you're seated? Are you keeping that seat, the one where you're seated? And he, and he established those rights legally through state laws. And my forefathers, well, my forefathers did as well, and they were either purchased by him or he inherited them. So then uh, what started happening uh, around the ninth, uh, late 80s, early 90s, and it had been going on before that, but <clears throat> these, uh, the Bureau of Land Management primarily, came in and said basically there's there was 53 ranchers in that area and they said basically uh, we're going to shut down your ranches we're going to take your allotments and close the allotments down and and um, and this was after a, a whole you know <coughs> couple decades of regulation and several of the ranchers were actually gone out of business or or couldn't make it anymore or had to go to work in construction or something else to subsidize their ranches because they they couldn't sustain their living there off of the regulations and let me just give you some of those things those regulations that the the bureau of land management was imposing upon them things such as not allowing their cattle to go out um only, only during certain periods of time that basically they got to they were shortening and shortening that time and in that area because it's such a, a large area and you have to gather your cattle in a in a different way than most you know these ranches do it's it's very expensive and, and you really can't uh, you really can't gather all your cattle like like you know you don't go out in the field and just gather them up it takes months to gather all your cattle so these regulations of imposing that they had to gather their cattle and and then uh, and, and then you know feed them somewhere else and then put them back on where it was very difficult and and then also they would minimize their cattle count uh, to the point and it got to the point where in their own codes and regulations there was absolutely no way that the ranchers could survive and uh, in uh, the in the Southern Nevada District Office, Bureau of Land Management District Office, there was a, a slogan that the district manager had in her office, and it said right on the wall, "No no moo by '92, cattle free by '93." And it was obviously that their their objective was to remove the rancher completely from the land, all the cattle. And they were doing it through these regulations and imposing these things and forcing them upon the ranchers to the point where there was no way for them to survive. And that, that, was, that was their goal. And uh, it might not make sense, and I hope I can tie some of these things together of why they did these things and why they're doing them to, to you and, and have been for many years. But that's what was happening. And so it got to about where there was about 12 ranchers left. All the rest of them just, they, they just couldn't make it any longer. They, they ended up, you know, generational gaps. The old ranchers got tired and they got too old and they pass it on and the, new, the younger generation didn't want to fight and just ended, ended up being where it got down to about 12 ranchers. And then the, uh, uh, in conjunction with the county, the federal government basically went in there and offered these ranchers uh, to buy out their grazing rights. And uh, so they did, and they, they bought 10 of the 12 grazing rights. So now there was only two ranchers left. And I remember when that happened, I was, I was uh, probably 12 or 13, about the age of my, my son Bowen here, when that happened. And... Uh, 
I remember my dad being very, very upset about it because they only paid him $75,000. And my dad was, but that's how desperate they began because they could see and, and they were actually being threatened that uh, if they don't take the money, that they're going to be put out of business anyway. They're going to, their allotments are going to be closed. So you might as well take the, take the money and, and, and be happy you got a little bit. And, but my dad, I remember him saying that, uh, that they sold their heritage, came out and carving out of this, this desert. That they, they bled and died and buried their, 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 for, their forefathers in, in, on this land. And now they're literally being treated like they're renters. And the renter's saying, we're no longer going to rent this to you. And, uh, and there's nothing you could do. Nothing. And so uh, that's what happened. And it left uh, two ranchers, my father and a man named Keith Nay. And, uh, and they simply at that point said no. They said, no, you're not taking my ranch. You're not taking my heritage. Right. You're not taking what I am going to pass on to my children. And they said, no. Keith Nay, shortly after that, died of a, of a heart attack. And uh, I really think, in my personal opinion, that it became very stressful for him. And, and he, was, he, was, he wasn't very old. He was in his 60s. Mm. Um, and that left my dad alone. But the interesting thing is if you back up just a few, well, you know, probably 10, even 10, 15 years before that, when you had all these ranchers still ranching in that area, and they could see that these regulations and these, these uh, um, you know, actions from the, from the federal government and were basically going to put them out of business. And uh, they began to search for their rights. What rights did they have to be there? You know, they knew they had rights. They understood that these rights were established by prior appropriation and by beneficial use, and that they were there, they were documented, that they had followed all the state laws. They knew that they were, all these things were happening. Okay, she's not going to sit down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, so they, the, the ranchers together, began to study how, how are they going to defend their rights. And this was going on in, you know, southern Nevada, northern Nevada, other states as well. It was a big movement. They created a, a cattlemen's association, and they really, they hired lawyers and you know, they, they began to really try to dig into these codes and regulations and loopholes and how are they going to beat the, you know, the, you know in, in, this, in this Nevada area. Their excuse was the desert tortoise. And they said the desert tortoise and the cattle can't live together. <laughs> and, and that the cattle were actually, um, you know, destroying the habitat of the desert tortoise. Now let me ask you, does that sound familiar? <laughs> Okay. Give me a break. Now, all I'm going to say here sounds familiar. Just put, you just plug in different species and different studies. Yep. And it's the exact same thing it happens over and over. It's it's the greatest scam that's ever, in my opinion, happened in the in in in, in America and maybe even the world. That they take an endangered species and get the public sympathy that we got to protect this species. And then they enforce their rules and regulations upon you and take your right away. And then we find out 20 years later that their actions actually destroyed the species. Actually destroyed the habitat of the species. And that the only thing that it did was put them in power and control. That's it. Yeah. Sound familiar? Well, that's what was happening. But we didn't understand the game back then, you know, not near as clear as we, we understand it now. Right. And so they would try to fight, they did studies, they hired independent, you know, scientists to come out and do a study, and what did the independent scientists find? That the desert tortoise relied upon 
the uh, the the cattle for for part of its habitat, and that where the cattle were, the desert tortoise count was higher, and where the cattle was not, the desert tortoise count was lower. And but when we presented this to the federal courts. You know what? The judge said, this is interesting and actually became pretty interested in these studies because it was directly opposite of what the federal government's own studies were. Their studies were showing that, you know, that they were contaminating the water and that it was causing a disease for the desert tortoise and, I mean, it goes on and on. It was exactly opposite of what our independent studies were showing. And so the judge began to kind of, you know, look at both of them and then the, US, the attorneys for the, for the Bureau of Land Management said, Your Honor, I want to show you something. And he, he brings up a, an act of Congress or something in their codes. I don't remember what it was. And basically it said that, that the, the federal agent that's involved in the, basically the studies and all gets to choose what study is used in the court. And the judge doesn't get to decide, and it really doesn't matter if we did independent studies. And so in the reality, what are they saying? That the truth doesn't matter. And that no matter what they do, they're right. And so the judge says, yeah, that is what the law says. I guess you're right, so let's move forward. And that's what we experience time and time again. Knowing that it was unjust, knowing that it was incorrect. And then later, just kind of to emphasize, or to in this little story about the desert tortoise. Later, a Bureau of Land Management whistleblower who got disgruntled because of something that happened inside the agency, he revealed that the Bureau of Land Management had 55 gallon barrels clear full of these three inch tortoise shells. And they had holes in the back, the, the top of them. And they were from the ravens. And that that is actually what was causing the 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 um, the tor the the desert tortoise count to drop in you know the top population, and that the Bureau of Land Management knew it the entire time that they were running these ranchers off their heritage, and they were using in the courts. They knew that it was the ravens that were causing and did destruction among the, the, the population of the desert tortoise. And, and yet they continued with the narrative that it was the cattle. So uh, this, is, this, is how I, this is what I grew up with. And my dad at some point finally said, no, you're not taking my ranch. And then he said, hell no. He did. He fired the Bureau of Land Management. He said, you're a management company. You're a management entity, I guess, to say. And I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to hire you and pay you to manage me out of my business. And he said, no. And of course, they say, you can't say no to us. And they tried to drag him into court. And my dad, my dad ignored him. And he ignored him pr primarily for 20 years. And every time they tried to impose something on him, he would basically say, I followed all the state laws and the federal government has no jurisdiction on this land. And the federal government didn't know what to do with it. And I'll, 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 I want to explain to, uh, especially to the ranchers and to the land users in this room, something that, was very, that protected my dad. There's a couple things that protected my dad. Um, I'm going to mention three of them. One was my dad would not sign a grazing permit, which is a contract. That's all it is. He understood after all this study that him and the ranchers did, he understood that the federal government does not have jurisdiction over the land and the resources, that they're actually uh, acting outside the Constitution when they do so. He understood that, so therefore, he knew that the only power they had was when you give it to them by, by signing a contract. A contract is what? It's this. It's 
I agree to do this, you agree to do this, and if we violate that, or I violate it, their contracts are like, if you violate that, this is the punishment. And so what would happen was, the other ranchers and ranchers all over the West would sign these grazing contracts, and it says right there, that you have to obey us, you have to you know, do what we say, our range cons say, um, and if you don't, this, these, are, these are the things that we, we can impose upon you. And so when the ranchers would go out, uh, go, become in violation because they couldn't survive anymore under their regulation, then they would pull them in a federal court and they'd say, the Bureau of Land Management would say to the judge, look judge, so-and-so, rancher so-and-so signed this. He said he would do this, this, and this, and this. He hasn't done that. He signed it and agreed to it. So therefore, judge, you have to do this, this, and this. And the judge would go, yep, you're right. Slam the, the mallet down. And my dad would never allow himself to be in that situation. He would never sign a grazing contract and it put him outside the authority of the federal government because the federal government only has authority under contractual law when it comes to the land and resources. And they have basically buffalo people all over the West into believing that they have the, that they own the land and that you are the leasee, the renter. And therefore you have to sign a rental contract. And that is absolutely incorrect. And it is false. And it, they have done it deceptively. They have done it over many decades and through generational gaps because our forefathers knew dang well that they owned those ranches and that they owned the grass on them. They understood the principles of multiple use, meaning that they owned, it was vested property. That grass was theirs. They, it was their property. They could sell it, trade it, borrow against it. And if someone came to steal it, they could stop them with force because it was theirs. And it was through just years of deception and generational gaps that the federal land agencies transferred this right and buffalo the people to believe that it's a privilege, that they own it and now they're gonna lease it back to you. And we sign it away. And until you stop signing those, and I, I tell you the, the grazing issue, well, that's, we can't stand the federal government. We can't do that. You know, we'll lose our ranches. We'll lose our heritage. And so 25 years later, we see who was right. My dad is the last rancher in Southern Nevada. Every single one of them are gone now because they try to negotiate, they try to create committees and associations, they hire lawyers, and every single one of them are gone now, except my dad, because my dad says, no, these are my rights, and you will not take them. I, I, So now, we, you know, there's a there's still more to this story, right? Yeah. <laughs> what were the other things you did? Thank you. So, thanks for the reminders, because it's very important. Uh, I said I would mention three things. Uh, one was he wouldn't sign the contracts. He would not. Uh, he would not say that someone else owned them. He 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 said these are mine and he was claiming them as his. Uh, second, he called on the state and the county sheriff, okay, to protect, okay? Now, I want you to understand that they never ever really did, to the, at least to the full level. But he did reach the county sheriff several times and met with them and explained to them that these are my rights, you know, I, I have inherited or purchased these rights, and they've been in my family for many generations. And, uh, and I've continually beneficially used these rights. I've, I've, I've improved them, and they're mine. And you know, there could have been a lot of legal talk back and forth, but 
he, he, he made it very clear to the sheriff that you are elected for only one reason. And it's not to give people on a county road a ticket. You are elected for one reason, and that reason is to protect the individual rights in your county. I remember hearing talk about, think, you know, about that these are my rights, and so it is your duty to protect them. And it's interesting, in the, the sheriff's oath, when he takes an oath, he takes an oath to defend, uh, a, a defend against those both domestic and foreign. Isn't that interesting? Not, he doesn't take an oath to defend, you know, <coughs> somewhere else. He takes an oath to defend right here. Right in your county. So he understood that. And the sheriff did make, because the sheriff would be like, they, he, they would go back to the federal government and say, look, you know, I, re I really don't want this in my county. You know, so for almost 20 years, you know, there was communication between the federal agencies and the sheriff, and, the, and, and it did help protect my dad's rights. And of course, he called on the states, and the states pretty much just ignored him. Um, or, you know, assisted the federal government. And they're, they're, but that was, that was the second thing he did. And the third thing, he always, he was very public about everything he did. He wrote letters and, and got the media involved and always was very public. And, but the third thing that he did is he always made sure that it was clear that he was going to defend his rights, that he was going to call his friends together if he had to, and he was going to defend his rights. And he, he would use the terminology, I will do whatever it takes. And that's what he would say. And they would say, well, what does that mean? And he would say, whatever it takes. And they'd say, well, what does whatever it takes mean? And he would say, whatever it takes. And they would try to give it, even they, I mean, it, it, it drove them crazy. So we know that actually in 2012, the federal government actually came to try to, they began to uh, do what they were going to do in 2014, and that that was stopped by the sheriff. The sheriff said, no, you know, you don't have things right legally, and therefore you've got to go back to the court and, and get some things done before you can have my blessing on it. So they did do that. They went back to the court, and of course the federal court gave them what they wanted. And then in 2014, uh, the one of the well the one of the days counts. We know that there was at least 214 or 13 uh, armed agents that came came up on the ranch and surrounded our ranch. Uh, we know that 145 of them or 43 of them were um, actually fully you know tactical you know uh, trained uh, men, and that there was 19 contractors and the rest were like the support team. And they surrounded our ranch with snipers on the hills, high-tech surveillance equipment, and they began to threaten our family and say things like, if you resist in any way, this will be another Waco or Ruby Ridge. They said things to the very direct that we will kill you. Um, the snipers, we, we later got their uh, operating plans, uh, going through court and trial, we got their operating plans, and their operating plans make it very clear that this was a military type operation, that they used military command systems, and that they used military uh, equipment and gear, and, uh, and that even the U.S. attorney uh, in court had to admit that this was a military type operation. And uh, that they had snipers on the hills, that they were um, in a 360 degrees uh, uh, surveillance, and that they were they were issued uh, government rifles with optics, and that they had the authority to use lethal force. Um, if you know, if, 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 if lethal force was imminent, basically that's that's what it said. And and this was you know my family. Um, I could go into a lot of lot of details about what happened, but ultimately. Uh, we kind of came together as a family, and there was 
at the beginning, we really thought that they were going to kill us. And, and we had every reason to believe. They were, they were literally threatening. They were, uh, everywhere they went, they would be in a convoy, you know, of four or five or six armed vehicles escorting like a, a, a contract cowboys, um, you know, equipment, truck, trailer, whatever. And it was, it was just me. They had helicopters. Uh, they, they had locked down the whole range and had guards on each road going out off the main road. And uh, I, I do not have time here to tell you all the details of what they were, they were going to do or what they, they were doing. Um, ultimately, they, it was cabin season and they were running the cows really hard with, with helicopters and leaving the baby cows out of the desert. Um, and they were actually killing uh, several of the cows. Uh, just running them to death. Uh, when everything was said and done, they had uh, dug a, a huge pit. We're just throwing the dead cattle in there. Um, they were shooting our, our prize bulls and other cattle from the air, from helicopters. And uh, uh, the uh, agent in charge, Dan Love, said that I can do whatever I want with these cattle. They're government property. And uh, he said, I can shoot them and throw them in a pit if I want. And those are his own words. So that, that happened, and uh, the interesting thing was we didn't know what, what we were going to do. We were just praying and asking for guidance and protection and direction. And we came together as a family, and we began to pray and plead with the Lord to help us and bless us. And things started to evolve where we were able to make little stands, a little stand here and a little stand there. And people started to seeing that locally at first and they started to gather and more and more people. And then on Wednesday, they were coming down out of the mountains uh, and they were in, uh, there was 13 armed vehicles and they were escorting a, a dump truck pulling a backhoe. And this, you know, this concerned us. We didn't know, we thought it was either a rendering truck or we thought that they were up there, you know, destroying something. And basically, again, to make a long story short, uh, we protested them as they began to come on the road. And they got out of their vehicles with their dogs and began to sick their dogs on us and do several other things to us, which we found out the day before that they were training their dogs using the exact same words that we were using when we were protesting the day before. So they're actually training their dogs to attack, you know, the very us using the very words that we were using the day before. And I was on my uh, I was on my four wheeler and kind of came back up around them, and I was trying to get up in a, on a high enough elevation that I could see in the back of that dump truck, and I could never get high enough that I could see what was in the back of it. So as the dump truck came on the road. I come down with the four-wheeler and I drove right in front of that dump truck and put the four-wheeler in park and put the brake on and stepped off the four-wheeler and began to ask them what was in the back of the truck. And, and of course there's, you know, several, you know, there's probably, I don't know, there's 20 or, 20 or 30 federal agents there and they're, you know, screaming and yelling and they sick their dog on me at first and then they end up uh, tasing me uh, m multiple times and uh, but we still stood there in front of that dump truck asking what was in there and once kind of the you know they they tased us multiple times stick their dogs on us and we still weren't willing to to move I actually walked around the dump truck and climbed in the back of it and saw with my own eyes what was in the back of that dump truck and I know this might sound a little insensitive but what I saw on the back was worse than a rendering truck. What I saw on the back of it was they were in the mountains destroying our water infrastructure that had been in, been in those mountains for over 100 years. And uh, they knew exactly where our rights were. They knew exactly what they had to do. They had to eliminate the beneficial use because like in our state, the same as here in California, it's a use it or lose it, water law state. And if you can't prove up on it and use it for up to, you know, over five years, they, they can ask someone else and ask claim it. They knew what they were doing exactly. They knew that our grazing rights were tied to our water rights.
And they knew that if they can eliminate our water rights and the use of it, that they can eliminate our grazing rights as well. And it was interesting because when we went through trial, and I'll get to that a little bit, we saw how afraid they were that we knew that we owned those rights. We saw how the federal uh, attorneys squirmed, how they tried to eliminate us from speaking about anything about water rights. How they, I mean, they, you know, motion of eliminate after motion of eliminate, which means they're trying to eliminate any, any speaking of that in, in, the, in the federal court system. Because they understood that we owned those rights. And I'm telling you now that you own rights here. And they know you own it. And their greatest fear is that you actually understand it. That you understand that you own those rights. <laughs> because the first part of maintaining rights is claiming them. Knowing that they're yours. It's the first part. You have to claim your right. You cannot maintain your right and say they're not yours. And you wonder, we wonder, because all of us do, why we are losing our rights. But yet we will not claim them. We won't say that they're ours. And I don't know if that's the good nature of most humans. I don't know. But, you know, maybe, maybe it seems too greedy to say they're ours. But it is divine law for an individual to own property. And until you understand that and are willing to say, I own this because the creator of this world made it possible for me to own it. And it's therefore, it's my stewardship. I, got, I have to take care of it. I got to use it for the benefit of myself and my fellow man. I need to be responsible with it. I need to take care of it. But I own it. And ownership, by definition, is the power to control. You can't say I own some, something and then someone else controls it. That's not ownership. Ownership is the power to control. And if somebody else controls what you think you own, you don't own it. So, we took a stand. And that, they videoed that, uh, I, while we were there, right, right before I actually drove the four-wheeler in front of the, the dump truck, one of the federal agents come right behind my Aunt Margaret, 57-year-old woman, and literally picks her up and body slams her on the asphalt. And if you, if you think I'm exaggerating what I'm saying, I want you tonight to go on the internet and watch it. I am not exaggerating to try to, you know, to make this something that it's not. And uh, but we stood. We knew that right there and then that they, could, they were going to have to take our lives away before they were going to take our heritage and our livelihoods away. And when I came to the ranch, because I, I didn't live on the ranch, I don't live on the ranch now. When I came to the ranch, there's many circumstances that actually brought me there. But I actually said to the county uh, under sheriff, I said, this is not worth dying over. I actually said that. And I tell you, by Wednesday, when I saw what they were doing, I completely changed my mind. It was absolutely worth dying for. Because I knew that I couldn't pass on to my son what was happening there on my father's ranch. And there was many others that believed the same thing. So we stood. And that, that little incident there on Wednesday uh, was caught on video, thanks to our phones and social media which is a great tool to defend and protect ourselves when we're in the right. And in fact, by that night, if, if I remember clearly, and I'm pretty sure I have it right, 
that video had 1.3 million views. And people from all over the country, actually all over the continent, started flowing to the Bundy Ranch. Wow. And I remember one man comes up to me and he says, Ammon, my name's so-and-so, and I came from New Hampshire. I just drove 34 hours to get here. What do you want me to do? Oh my God. And that happened, I, there was a man from Alaska, there was a man from that was uh, in our in Iraq that actually called and after you know there was hundreds of people there he actually called and sent a hundred pizzas ordered a hundred pizzas because <laughs> he couldn't be there himself <laughs> and as a, it was a great unity of the people and ultimately what happened was it escalated they continued and then once the once the these federal agents began to see that the people were united and that they were not going to be uh, deterred, that they were, they were there to stand, that they, they, actually, they actually stopped the operation. And they began to, they gathered all the cattle that, that they had, which is almost 400 head of cattle at this time, put them in a, in a corral. And they had plans to sell those cattle. Uh, they actually had an auctioneer, an auction, a cattle livestock auction in, in central Utah that they paid uh, reportedly 300, an extra $300,000 just to run them through their auction. And, but what happened was the governor of Utah ordered them to not bring those cattle into Utah. That's right. He even put, they even put the hire patrol at the check station and said, any cattle that come in here, you check to make sure that they're not the Bundy's cattle. And if they are, you do not let them come into this state. Idaho wouldn't let them come into this state. Arizona wouldn't let them come to it. And actually even California, this auction yards in California would not sell those cattle. And they were stuck there on the Bundy Ranch. <laughs> Until enough people from all over the country could come together and go up there and insist that they release those cattle. And there's a, how good Americans are. What's that? It shows you how good Americans are. That's right. It shows you how we defend our rights and how we unite and come together and do that. And so what happened? I wish I could show you a couple pictures because I have a picture of it's I don't want to exaggerate, but I would say it's almost a half a mile, bumper to bumper, and I'm not exaggerating, of federal vehicles on their way out of the Bundy Ranch. <laughs> and after they left, the, we went in there, and the people lined the hills, went in there, opened up the gates, and we drove those cattle back up to the river. And they were hurting. They had three or, you know, three or four, even some of them in five days, um, were in pretty bad shape. There was several of them were dead in the, dead in the um, corrals. Many of them had broken hips and broken you know, joints and different things. Um, they were trying to calve right there in those corrals. And, but we were able to take them and drive them back down to the river where the sand, where there's sand and they were able to get some good grass and, and uh, people were able to see that and it was almost like a miracle. In fact, I tell you, it was a miracle. Yeah. It was a miracle, right? It was an American miracle, it really was. And I was just, I was just privileged to be part of it. And to even speak about it just brings me uh, to tears because of how merciful God is and how merciful he was to us. Because we went just a few days from thinking that it, this was going to be the last week of our lives right. to the, our cattle coming back to the range. How, how we thought, I remember at the beginning that we thinking, how in the world are we ever going to preserve our ranch? But the Lord made it happen. 
And he did it by touching the hearts of individuals. That's right. He touched their hearts and they came to the ranch. And they knew and understood that that was what had to be done. And I, again, I share these things with you because I hope you can see the parallel of what can happen here and what must happen here. Yeah. And how it is crucial that an individual defends his rights first, claims them, uses them, and then defends them. And when he does that, because of the circumstance that we are in, he will certainly be put under the force. And at that point, all of us, in the effort of, to love our neighbor and to follow the Spirit of the Lord, we have to go and stand with that person. Our rights are not, will not be protected in an association. They will not be. They are protected by an individual saying, these are my rights, I will use them. And if anybody comes to take them, I will defend them. And I will call on my neighbors to defend them with me. That's the way rights are defended and maintained. Mm -hmm. Rights are not maintained in the courts. I hate to break the news. Look, tell me when any rights have been ever protected and defended in the courts, in history. I mean, let's go to the Bible. What's the history of the courts in taking rights? They're not defended there. We have been actually Buffalo to believe that that's where rights are defended. Rights are defended on the grounds in which the rights were established, which is your ranch or your waters. If that water was, if that water right was established right there at the diversion of when that water began to be beneficially used by you, that's where that right is defended, is right there at the diversion. It's just the fact, it's natural law. And we have been, we, we believe that our rights are somehow protected in some court that's arbitrarily be controlled by a judge. And I like what my dad says best about the federal court system. He says, you know, going to the federal court with a federal judge and federal attorneys and federal uh, agencies and federal rules of regulation uh, is like a man coming into your house that beats up, comes in your house and beats up your wife and children. So you take him to court. And they say, all arise for the honorable judge, and in walks a man with a black robe, and it's the very man that beat up your wife and children. Because that's what it's like. Um, so I experienced this, and I saw that what happened there at the ranch. And I saw how my dad's rights were preserved and I was a witness of it. And I felt very privileged, very honored to be a part of that. I felt the spirit of the Lord guide and direct us. And I knew that we were being protected by something other than just man. And I, I, I began to study um, this deeper and these issues deeper. And I began to understand more of a lot of the things that are written in the Declaration of Independence. And I began to understand the Constitution better. And I began to understand, you know, a lot of these principles of freedom and these laws of nature the best I could. And uh, then it wasn't very long after that, I was introduced to a family in Eastern Oregon, the Hammond family. And I saw what was happening to them, and I could completely relate to them. And I could just see, and I began to study without them even knowing what was happening to them. And I just, I could see exactly what was happening, that this family was, had suffered for the, you know, 
several decades in the very much the same way in which our family had suffered. And I felt moved again by the Spirit of the Lord. And I recognized that Spirit moving me and telling me to act, telling me that it was your responsibility because you knew and you had experienced what it took in order to preserve their rights. And so I began to do and follow, you know, the little guidance that I was getting the best I could. I went to the county sheriff and told them, hey, your only duty is to do this. And we met many, many times. And he just wouldn't stand. And I began, I, I, I also uh, understood that as soon as they found out that the federal government found out that I was there, that they began to send agents to his office. And that that sheriff was in a great, great conflict with himself. But the influence was too great. The federal influence was too great. And he began to fold, and I could see that. And so we, we, we uh, put together a petition of redress of grievance to petition our government. And we asked them to do something very simple in that county. We asked the county sheriff and the elected representatives to put together an evidential hearing board. All we were asking to do is to look at the Hammond case and to deter determine if what was happening to the Hammonds was just or not. And then make decisions after that. And we had literally tens of thousands of people sign that petition. At one point, because it was an online signing process, at one point, we were getting a signature less than every three minutes. And yet, and we, we, we actually had to send that petition when people were still signing it because we, we needed to get it to the right people. And they ignored it. I mean, not even one response, email, nothing. Completely ignored it. And so here we're sitting here knowing that this family is unjustly going to prison for the second time under terrorist arsenal charges. They actually charged them under terrorist arsenal charges under the, uh, the Effective Death Penalty, the Anti-Terrorism Effective Death Penalty Act of 1996 and as arsenal terrorists, which held a minimum of five year sentence. They had already served time, respectively, uh, 13 months or 15 months, and now they were going back to prison. There's a lot of history there. But it was completely unjust. Uh, the, the, the law, I mean, I won't get into the details, but, and then we were trying, we were exposing the injustice. We were trying to go through a Republican form of government in order to bring light to it, get them to stand, which is their duty, and, and the whole reason why we have them. And we were being completely ignored. Tens of thousands of people signing petitions. Anybody who has had a petition knows that that's, that's quite an accomplishment. And this was going on in a very short period of time, and we were ignored. We found out later why. Because the FBI went to each one of the, the county sheriff and each one of the representatives and told them or threatened them not to respond. Imagine that. You have a representative who is supposed to, we, repre we, we elect him and hire him or her to represent our rights and to defend them. And the very entity that is taking the rights and putting this family in prison unjustly is threatening our representatives to not respond. I had a county commissioner come to me with tears and tell me that. That's how I know, along with emails later from our discovery in our court case. And so what was what were we to do? What were the people to do? Were we all just to go home? And say, you know what? This is so wrong. 
our government completely has collapsed and been corrupted and, and, and has failed. Let's just all go home? No. There's no way after what happened there that I could go home. We're Americans. Nobody can. I, I wanted to go home so bad. I can't tell you. I wanted to go home. I had a little baby, a wife, five other children, and I wanted to go home. I didn't. It was. I was sick of the everything that was happening. I could see that our government completely broke down. I wanted to go home. That I felt that little that spirit in me tell me, no, you can't go home. If you go home, you'll never have peace again in this life. And you'll be accountable to me in the life after. I knew I couldn't go home. And so, I began to try to understand what I was supposed to do and what I could do. Trying to look for a peaceful way in which we could bring as much attention to this as we could. And I began to be able to see that there was a wildlife refuge about 35 miles out of Burns, which that's, and it was just, and it was surrounded the Hammonds Ranch. And they were very instrumental in trying to take the Hammonds Ranch and a lot of the issues that were happening. And I felt very, very clear and very sure that I was supposed to go into that, into that refuge with as many people as would follow me, and we were just supposed to sit right there and do it in a peaceful way, do it on a weekend when no one was there. And so that's what we did. We did it. I, I did a bunch of research on the refuge and found out again that that refuge was about, it's about 187,000 uh, acres. And that it one, at one time, all of that land was owned by private ranchers. And that, you know, over a 60 year period of time, those ranches through many different uh, deceptive and forceful ways lost their ranches and they ended up being entitled to the U.S. government under the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And by this time I had studied quite a few of the laws and one of the laws that I studied was what's called the Adverse Possession Law. And it's, an, it's, a, it's a law in all the states. It's a natural law. It is absolutely necessary to have adverse possession. And I can go into that and tell you why, uh, but it is, it is one of God's laws in order to make sure that a certain entity or a certain man with a lot of money or, or doesn't come in and suck up all the land and hold it to himself. And uh, I began to study these laws. Anyway, we went into the refuge there, and I, I clearly saw before I went to the refuge that Adverse possession was exactly what the federal government was using upon the people. And there are certain things you have to do. You have to go in and openly say we're claiming. Right? For yourself. You have to raise the flag, change the signs. And you you watch, you, if you understand what the federal government has done, or the state, it doesn't matter. Because I, I know that you live in California, I forgot that. They came. They come in and they began. They put their signs up. They began to. They, they began to tag everything because what they're doing is they're actually adversely taking your property. They have to put their signs on it. They have to. They map it and they, they put their name on the map. They are taking claim of your property. It's natural law. They know it and understand it very well. The other thing is they have to begin to use it, beneficially use it for themselves. And what, what does the federal government do? They lease it back to you. They say it's ours. We're going to beneficially use it by leasing it back to you. They begin to profit off of it. They use it. They, they build their buildings. 
they make almost a, a private park, and they began to create a tremendous amount of jobs off of that land. And that's beneficial use. And then another piece of adverse possession is you have to be willing to, and strong enough to keep it. You have to defend it. And they're willing to use actually the force of law that was created by the people. And I say that, um, I'll, I'll just leave it at that because there, there's a lot of pieces to that that, that aren't right. I did, but they use that against, the, our own, against themselves, against us. And so I began to understand this. And so what did we do? We went into the refuge and we claimed adverse possession. We changed the signs. We flew the American flag as high as we could fly it. And we said, this land belongs to the people of Harney County. We changed it from the uh, Malheur National Wildlife Refuge to the Harney County Resource Center. <laughs> we changed the signs and we began to take a, a loop. And as far as we began to change the signs and we had a, a radius that we changed the signs and we, it was gonna get bigger and bigger, right? And we said, and then we had a, a use plan. We began to, um, they had a whole bunch of equipment there. We were gonna, we had a whole use plan when the snow melted to get those people back. And we were basically reversing adverse possession because that's how they've taken it from us. And we were doing that one because we felt it was right. And two, because we knew that it was going to be an example of how and what people must do in order to preserve their rights. Right. Now the interesting thing is, the Lord was protecting us the whole time. Because what happened was, and this is, I know I might be talking about for a, long, a little bit longer than you wanted me to, but, but the Lord was protecting us, just like he protected us in Nevada. Because what happened was, is when after we were arrested, we were thrown in those horrible places, and we had to fight and suffer through a 10-month trial in, in Oregon, that was just the first part of it, but when we got in the courtroom and we were finally able to get the truth in front of the jury, we began to tell them exactly what I'm telling you today. And we began to show them under the protest of the U.S. attorneys how adverse possession is legal. It's legal. In every state of the United States of America, it is legal. And that's what we were doing. And the jury saw that, they understood it, and they said what those men and women were doing there, besides standing up and loving their neighbor, was legal. And we were acquitted on all charges. Now, Yeah, that's a whole other. She asked why did I have to be in prison while during the trial? Well, just so you know, that while I was, while myself and others were in, arrested and incarcerated and facing these charges in Oregon, uh, we were also charged in Nevada uh, for, you know, what they, they, were, they were all lies, a 63 page indictment of lies. But our sentence is down there. We were, there was 19 counts, and we were facing 106 years of minimum sentence. And as many of you know, the Lord again, it took almost two years, but the Lord again protected us down there. And he is a great guy. And ultimately, those charges were dismissed against us because of the corruption and deception of the federal government in, in the court system. The court finally said that this is too much. I can't, we cannot, I can't even cover this up. And therefore we have to dismiss these charges with prejudice, which means they can't bring them up, get up, they can't bring them up against us anymore. <laughs> now, when I, when I was at the refuge, the most 
interesting thing happened because we first went in there and we thought, oh no, they're going to kill us. <laughs> but we're here. We know we're supposed to be here. And what we had hoped, and we, what we, well, at least what I had hoped and what I had planned and felt is that people would start to come and we would have an opportunity to share with them what we were doing. And they did. At first, I remember a rancher comes, knocks on the door, and we open the door slowly, and he has a, he has a pot of uh, soup. And man, it was so good because we, we were hungry. It was middle of winter, it was like eight below. And he comes in and he begins to talk to us. And then he leaves. He tells his friends and his neighbors, and they start coming. And next thing you know, we got hundreds of people coming to the ranch, or to the refuge. And they're wanting to know. And so we began to do seminars and talk to them about their rights, these being their rights, not somebody else's rights. And then something very interesting started happening. Because we started to see the veterans coming and even law enforcement officers because they began to understand what we were doing and I want to show you a few things a man came and he was airborne in the army and I have to apologize I don't I didn't serve in the military and so the terminology I don't understand but he gave me his hat. He says, this is the only thing that I, I have that I could feel that's a, you know, important enough to me to give to you. And he takes his hat off. You know, I imagine that's very important to him. And he gave that to me. And I, I said, I don't, know, I don't know if I could take that. And then a man came and he was in a wheelchair. He had lost both of his legs serving in the military. And he gave me his officer's jacket for serving our country. And that he wanted us to, he wanted me to have this. And I've never worn it. I would never wear it. Because I don't feel like I earned it. But he insisted that I have it. Another man had served as a law enforcement officer, I believe, for 28 years. And he gave me his duty badge. And I kept it in my pocket. And when I was arrested, they took it from me. And now they won't give it back. But it was his 20-year duty badge. And he said, I, I feel that what you're doing it's so important that you need to have my duty badge. And I didn't. Give it back. <laughs> They're thieves, young, young lady. Mm -hmm. They are. And thieves don't give things back very easily. Then I had another man. He served as a colonel. He came to me. And who knows what the purple purple heart is? Yes. Who knows what the award is that's just the next level higher than the purple heart? Bronze. I'm just guessing. It's the bronze star. I don't deserve this. I did I didn't earn this. But he gave it to me and insisted that I have it. And I had to take it in honor of him and his sacrifice. And if you I, I, I recommend that you go and find out what it takes to be awarded a bronze star. It's a tremendous sacrifice. You're and then, a man comes up to me. He gives me this flag. 
and he says, my brother died serving in Iraq. And this flag was the flag that they draped over his casket. This over his casket. And he gave it to me. I don't deserve it. But out of honor to him and his brother, I hold it and share it with you. Now let me ask you something. Is that what you were told about the refuge? Why? Why weren't you told the truth? There is an effort. There is a conspiracy to take your rights and to consolidate them into one body. Because when your rights are consolidated into one body, and what I mean by rights, I mean everything of value, the power that you have as an individual. There is an effort to consolidate that power into one body so that it can be easily controlled, manipulated, and used against you. And that, that power, there is, no more, there is no power that is greater than the lands and resources in which you use. There is no greater power. I challenge anybody in this county, in this state, all 49 million, to show me one thing that didn't come from the earth. Maybe they have a meteor rock. <laughs> <laughs> in this room, what, what, show me one thing that you use, benefit from, eat, enjoy, rely upon, that did not come from the earth. There is nothing. This computer, the food we eat, the cups, the chairs, this, this building that we're so grateful to have. Our homes, it came from the earth. It was created for us by a loving God. And he gave us and commanded us to take care of it, to use it and to benefit from it. Mm -hmm. Everything came from the earth. And there is an effort to take and consolidate that great power to be able to feed ourselves, to be able to travel in our own vehicles, to live in our homes, to have water, to, to water our fields and our animals or ourselves, to consolidate that power into one body so that it can control, control. Imagine one body controlling your water, the power that they have. Imagine that. I know, that's why I'm saying it. Imagine that. The founders understood this. They understood that the po power cannot be, that the power, especially of the natural resources, the land and the resources, cannot be consolidated in one, in one body. It's too risky. So they created a different type of government, a different type of social agreement, if you will. And that was that the, this great power would be distributed among all, anybody who wanted it. And then it's safe. It's safe because now it's distributed. They understood this about, about the government power, that, it was, that it's distributed among the people. They have the voting power to put people in and to decide what they're going to do in their own areas. That's called a Republican form of government, right? They distributed that power to all the people. 
they just they their 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 plan and the way that they set up the, this this country was to, that all the land was distributed among the people all the water all the resources were distributed so it couldn't be controlled and consolidated in one body and there is a great effort now for go by godless people to consolidate this great power of the people into one body and you cannot allow that to happen you cannot and you have your rights they're yours so stand on them claim them use them defend them yourselves and call on your neighbors to defend them with you because that is the way that rights are maintained and that is the way that God intended them to be maintained love your neighbor do not covet him live in peace with each other and stand for your neighbor when he needs you and I say these things in his name amen amen We all know who Jeanette Finnecom is. And <laughs> invited me to come down to witness the freeing of the Bundy family. It was just one of the most extraordinary experiences. Being outside of the courtroom, and there are people lined up ready to cheer and yell from the top of our lungs, freedom. And I remember your dad coming out. And I introduced him myself, and your mom says, oh, she's a good girl, and you got to meet her, Cliven. And I said, you know, my parents are cattle ranchers, and he said to me, where are the cattle ranchers? Why aren't they standing? Where were they when I needed them? And I said, you have not met Sister County yet, Cliven. So thank you for being here, and we're not done yet. Um, Kathy, we may need like a time check, but we wanted to give you all an opportunity to ask Ammon a question if you want. There's a mic here. Um, so just come up if you have a question. Sure, and Kathy wants you all to know that the silent auction is going to close in five minutes. So even uh -huh. while we're doing Q&A, feel free to go up and, and, and get your last, uh, put your last bid in. But, okay, so your Constitution, I know Ammon wants you to use it. Right, Ammon? Okay, so I'm going to start off with a couple of questions, or maybe one, and then we can go to you. Um, Ammon, can you tell us a little bit about the Wooten letter that came forward because of your trial and a little bit about the kill list and what is the kill list. So what happened and is during our trial, the U.S. attorneys in, in Nevada, this was in Nevada, U.S. attorneys were withholding a whole bunch of what's called exculpatory evidence, oh. which means evidence that would exonerate us. They're, they're holding it. Um, and we're talking about up, you know, close to like 3,500 pages worth of stuff. And so, and um, so, again, the Lord working. Uh, he must have violation. somehow inspired an, an individual by the name of Larry Wooten. And uh, 
he was the lead Bureau of Land Management investigator for this case. But he wasn't involved with the Bureau of Land Management on that level during the whole Bundy Ranch incident. He came on a little later, he was brought on, and he immediately began to, and uh, so he had to write a letter, and it was a 17 page letter. And in it we found out many different things, that we were targeted, that uh, the kill list, and that this kill list consisted of my father, and, and then they put a uh, protective order, or, or they sealed it. And then now we know that there is another letter, because what happened was, is the U.S. prosecutor said, well, the Wooten letter is just hearsay and that he was not telling the truth. So he wrote another letter, which we call Wooten II, and we've never been able to read it because the court actually put it under protective order. Yeah. And I don't know if the public will ever get to read it. Go ahead. Yeah. They and if you want, you can uh, announce who you are, where you're from, and your question for Ammon would be great. Thank you, Ammon. It was uh, really wonderful to be here to hear your story in person. Thank and you. Uh, uh, I'm Gunter Ambron. I'm from Cave Junction, Oregon, uh, Josephine County, and uh, we're big on neighborhood watch over in our area, and we protect our neighbors, and uh, we love them too, uh, even if they don't love us. But uh, <laughs> a little different way once in a while. But anyway, I do have a lot of Native American friends, and I've been trying to get the story across to them, and and of course. Uh, I said, well, I'm coming up to here to uh, listen to Ammon's story personally, and they, the concerns they had was about the Native American artifacts and the, 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 the damage. So I said, well, I'll ask Ammon directly when I get a chance to come up here. Yeah, thank you. So just kind of give a little back. At the refuge, there was, uh, evidently the refuge was actually built on Native American sacred grounds, okay, which is interesting. Um, and there was a whole bunch of artifacts that they had collected off the refuge and the Native Americans were concerned about that and there's there's a lot of issues and it had rats and anything else in there I mean literally um, there was a weasel that in there been in there as well and weasel and, and rats and mice don't mix very well so it was like there was blood everywhere and I mean it was really unkept and really uh, to me, very, um, I don't know, it wasn't very respectful to the Native American artifacts. And so we cleaned up that basement and uh, organized it and got them, got them to where they wouldn't, you know, they were, wouldn't be damaged. And we also collected all of the artifacts that were around and screwed around and we took them and uh, began to put them on the shelves and get them all organized and clean them up. And the, the federal government actually tried to use uh, the Native Americans against us. And they tried to say that we were actually damaging the artifacts. And in reality, they had been there for literally decades and decades, uh, you know, and just totally disregarded and disrespected Americans from coming and getting their facts. Because why would they be there? And so we took and contacted the tribe and actually offered them to them. And anyway, the whole thing ended up ending before they come and got them. But that's, that's the reality of what happened. So you tell them that we, we honored and respected their, you know, their uh, things that were important and sacred to them. So thank you. Thank you. In your, Ron's my name, I'm in Mount Shasta. Um, in your presentation, you talked about the key things about your rights, like a property owner, things of that nature, water rights and, uh, as a rancher and stuff. We have a problem here in Siskiyou County where I feel it's kind of a RICO problem because of uh, Pacific uh, Power colludes with the non uh, creating of a nonprofit to remove dams that does financial damage to the county. Uh, the ranches are going to be affected by it people downstream, upstream, and uh, some of the rights that the court ruled on for your protection. I was thinking whether or not they would have some applicable in a court case if such thing was pushed to 
to stop the removal of the dam. So, I appreciate that question. I, I want to re-emphasize that your rights are not protected and defended in the courts. I, I wish they were, but they're not. But we also have to do all we can do to try to, you know, resolve these issues through whatever methods we can. But I also, as I said here earlier, you, you don't negotiate with thieves. You can't. So, and that's what's happening. Because let me tell you what really, in my opinion, and I, I have to emphasize, in my opinion, I don't live here. I'm not going to act like I'm the authority in knowing these issues. Please don't think I'm a guest here, and I realize that I'm a guest here. And so I say this as a guest from outside looking in. But it appears to me that what's been stolen here is your right to govern yourselves. That's what's been stolen. And that is a right. You have a right as a people to decide how those waters are going to be dammed and distributed according to the individual rights. And th that is a right that you have. And so in, in, from outside looking in and experiencing what I'm experiencing, I believe what they've done in this case is they've stolen your right to self-govern. Take it back. Take it back. Before we get to you, sir, Ammon, you have, I've heard you say this before, no more moo, and I'll let you finish it. And can you tell us why the Center for Biological Diversity is so after you guys? Okay, so as I said, in the Southern Nevada District Office, uh, there was a, a logo on their wall that said, no move by 92, cattle free by 93. Um, the individual that was the Southern Nevada District Manager, her name was uh, Joanne, uh, Joanne Rugwell. Now in court, she got up on the stand and as we questioned her, we said, did you know that letter? None other than Mary Jo Rugwell. It had a Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, and it had her name on it. And at the bottom of the letter, it had her signature, Mary Jo Rugwell, Southern Nevada District Manager, and she signed it. And guess who that letter was to? The Nevada Department of Water Resources. And guess what she was asking? The Nevada Department of uh, Water Resources to revoke Clive and Bundy, my father's water rights. She is a liar. Yes. And she lied in open court to a jury. And as my dad says, he's never met anybody that doesn't work, that works for the Bureau of Land Management that's not a liar. <laughs> so, and if there is somebody, I, I would love to eat my words. So anyway, why? And the Center of Bio Bio Biological Diversity, which is an extreme environmental group that was very instrumental in basically encouraging the Bureau of Land Management to use force upon my family. And they did it, they threatened lawsuit, and we call it a friendly lawsuit. When two parties get together, they have the same objective. One of them says, hey, you sue me, and I'll use it as justification to go use force. And that's what was going on. Well, the Center of Biological Diversity is, a, is an environmental group, and they have an, a, a huge budget that they get from suing the federal government, or from grants, or from donations, uh, you know, full hair. Anyway, they, they're, they're well-funded. They're a group of, they have, I believe, around 100 attorneys. And um, they are of what I call the green religion or the environmental religion. And I'm glad you asked this question. And I, I'm sorry I'm, I'm being a little long-winded. And I hope you can bear with me. But 
you have to understand that removing these dams that uh, basically taking water away from the individuals, you know, removing ranches, uh, eliminating ranches, all of this makes perfect sense to them. And it can make perfect sense to us if we understand them. Because they don't believe that mankind, man and women, are children of God. They don't believe that man has been given the earth, the land, the resources for their benefit and use. What they believe is that man is only a species. That he has evolved because of over millions of years he's evolved and he's become more intellectually advanced than the other species. Hmm. And therefore it is their eliminating ranches makes perfect sense. And in fact, Randus, I believe he used like a spotted frog. I'm gonna, he said the spotted frog, and I might, I might be wrong on the terminology on that, but he said the spotted frog is more important than Jim and Susie's ranch. And then he stopped and paused, and he said a thousand times more important. Uh -huh. And that's who you're dealing with. It is an extreme religion and it is against mankind and against God, the creator, who gave the earth to mankind for his benefit. Psalm 115. Welfare. Psalm 115. So, absolutely. That's it. Yeah, my uh, family moved out here from North Dakota back in 1959. And my aunt bought a place up in Hawkinsville that she paid taxes on for I don't know how many years. And BLM stepped in and said, you're squatting on our property. Now, how can you be squatting when you're paying taxes every year on that property? And told her that if she did not clean the property up, tear her house down, that they were going to come in and demolish everything and put all the cost on her. Well, let me just ask you a question. Was it, a, was it like a property tax that they were paying, that she was paying the actual property yeah. tax on? Actual property And she wasn't tax. paying like a fee or a lease? No, to no, the, okay. it wasn't a lease. It was, it was a, a, a property tax. Right here in town in the courthouse. So the power to the tax, the power to destroy, but we know, who, who do we pay our taxes to? Yeah, but we pay, we pay it to the county, right? Yeah. And why do we pay a, a tax to the county? That's right, for a service. And the primary service is for defense of that very right, which we're paying a tax on. It's a trade, okay? Obviously that wasn't happening. And I'm not sure what the details are, but I can just say, tell you this, that that's happened many, many times over and that you're dealing with thieves. Well, yeah, because after she moved, I moved her back to North Dakota and stuff, the guy that bought property across the street and end up with her property. Yeah, I mean, that, again, I don't know the details. It's hard to see, but in what, in whose world do we think that in any way the federal government has jurisdiction over that private property, especially when she's being paying the tax, the county, a private, or a tax, property tax for the defense of her property. So. I don't know if I answered your question, but that's well, that's my response, do? I guess. Thank, so, you. thank you. Yeah, that's a great. Parents and our family, we were all interned. Uh, all the men in our family served in the army. Uh, we bought property back here in the 60s, early 70s, and it was their dream to retire here. Um, and sadly, my dad and my uncle have to sure that our legacy, their legacy, their sacrifice is not taken away before, you know, all this whole damn scheme has been going on. So um, I'm here to help make sure that our legacy, their legacy, their sacrifice is not taken away. Our new job at Montague. She's taught homeschooling with our new dog. And uh, when I got there, there was a sign. 
that was not there before. And it said that all visitors, 16 and over, need to have a valid California fishing license or hunting license or land pass in order to be on the property. What? No. Yeah. And no, it's I did secure. not, uh, it's there. I've been there for a little while, been a little busy. Don't usually get time off to take a walk around the park. And so I went to the office and uh, oh, we tried to open the door, it was locked. I knocked on the door and I saw a familiar face because uh, we used to walk out there when my daughter was in preschool. We used to walk out there, I used to, my, our old dog and I we used to walk out there every day while I waited for my daughter to get out of school because we live 30 miles away. I'm not gonna drive back and forth, you know? So anyway, I, I smiled at him, he smiled at me, and I said, is it true that I have to have a fishing license to walk my dog here? And he kind of shrunk, and he was like, yeah, it just happened, came up rather quick. We're getting a lot of hate about this. He said, you could get a land pass, Land pass is four dollars a day, or twenty-five dollars a year. He said, "So you're better off getting a fishing license." He said, "Do you have a computer?" And I said, "Yeah, thirty miles away." Yeah. He said, "Well, you can get one online." So after I kind of got my head around that, I said, "Wait a minute." So you mean to tell me I can't even give you $4 now for me to walk my dog? And he said, no, they don't trust us with money. We just buy beer. <laughs> I wouldn't trust him either. But <laughs> so let me, let me, uh, so this issue actually, believe it or not. He handed me this card. <laughs> I'd like to see that later. But so this issue actually is, is direct to the very things that I just was talking about. I because what they have done and what they are doing is they're, what are all the signs coming into the county, you know? Edward. Welcome to your public lands. Well, they're closing all right? the roads and everything. So, right. Edward, well, but, can I just read this? Because I think this answers exactly what you said. Land passes, this is from the California Department of Fish and Wildlife. Land passes support the management of CDFW lands for their ecological values and for their use and enjoyment by the public. Yeah. It's for the management. So, but you know what they call your ability to go on to what they say is public lands? They call it a privilege. Right. So that means okay. they can remove it. It is not a right. It is impossible to be a right and a privilege at the same time. And again, they have taken our lands who, you know, many, many people have, the, have rights vested to those lands through the multiple use doctrines, including the public. The public has established through beneficial use and actually through prior appropriation, they have established a right to access the land, to hunt, camp, fish on the public lands. It's their right. But the government has taken that right and says it's a privilege and therefore you have to pay for it they can do whatever they want with it because when it's a privilege what does that mean yes and we saw you can see in the in the anyway we can't do it here because we're not trusted agents you have to do it online but that's the principle here and until you say no it's my right to be here and I'm going to walk on that land with my kid and I'm going to enjoy it. No matter what. Until you do that, they will continue to convert our rights into privileges. So thank you. You'll be the final question, okay? Thanks. Okay, uh, my name is Cesar Garcia and I'm a local in this town. 
and right now, it years. got me thinking when you mentioned about snipers on the hill, federal agents like break to the knives with armaments that are meant for the military. It kind of makes you think, especially in the state of California with all the restrictions, at which point, uh, when will the Second Amendment have to step in? And at which point uh, is it, would it be necessitated for another Battle of Athens, if you guys get the reference? <laughs> and that's uh, my question for okay. this. So if we go to the Second Amendment, does the Second Amendment say the right to bear arms shall not be infringed? Yes. It does, right? But that's not all the Second Amendment says. If we go to it, you'll find it on page 21. You shouldn't that militia is mentioned? No. What What does militia mean? Is it a scary word like the, like the media is trying to impose upon, you know, trying to create? Is it scary? No. What, what is the militia? Armed citizenry. Every able-bodied person from the age of, I think, 18 to 46, I think, or something. That's the law. That's the law. That's what it says. And U.S. Code. That's what the that's who the militia is. So you are the militia. You are the militia. You are the militia. Everybody is militia, right? Every able-bodied person. And when you hear them say something different, that it's only for the Second Amendment is only for military purposes. That's incorrect. Even in their even in the old U.S. Code. Whatever it is. It's every able-bodied person is a militia, and it says a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state. What does that tell you? That every single one of you participating in the defense of your rights is the only way that you are going to be free. And when they start scribbling on it. And then it says, the right of the people, which is the militia, to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Right. And we get to where we're going to have to fight. So it tells you darn right clear, in my opinion, of how. You're going to have to fight for it. Well, how we have to be free. That's and it. that's just a reality. Natural law. I don't know why the Lord designed it that way. Yeah. But he did. So, anyway, thank you. Will you guys give this guy a hand? What, what's your first name? All right. Well, this has been an incredible event. We're seeing the men and women of Siskiyou County are waking up like nobody's business to fight. The, the rank ramp for the big trip that he made. It wasn't very long trip. He had to do all.